Thank you, Loretta. Good morning, everyone. My name is Cindy Tan. I'm the Manager of Partnerships and Consultation at the Ontario Growth Secretariat, Ministry of Municipal Affairs. Thank you so much for joining us today, and a special thanks to OPPI for hosting this webinar for us. Uh, as Loretta mentioned, today's presentation will provide an overview of the four new and updated provincial land use plans which were released on May 18th. The Growth Plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, the Green Belt Plan, the Oak Ridge's Marine Conservation Plan, and the Niagara Escarpment Plan. Uh, before starting the technical presentation, I'd like to provide a brief overview of the coordinated land use planning review uh, process that brought us to where we are today. Over two years ago, the province launched the Coordinated Land Use Planning Review to see how the four plans could be updated and improved. Given the plan's interconnected nature and their shared geography, uh, a coordinated approach was taken. We benefited greatly from a wide range of input from the public, municipalities, stakeholders, and Indigenous communities through this process. Many of you provided input. Thank you very much for your comments. We started out the process in February 2015 when we, the province went out to hear how the plans were working and how they could be improved. An advisory panel chaired by David Crombie provided 87 recommendations that the province reviewed carefully and uh, tried its best to address. Proposed plans were released in May 2016 and we went out for an additional round of feedback on the proposed plan. All of that input, as well as input on proposed changes uh, to the Greenbelt Outer Boundary, were used to arrive at the final plan. In total, across the coordinated review, we benefited from meeting with members of the public and stakeholders at 35 sessions across the region, and we received a total of 42,000 submissions. The Niagara Escarpment Commission also held complimentary engagement sessions. What you're going to hear today are the results that re of this widespread engagement. Uh, I will now pass the presentation over to our two presenters who will be speaking uh, today. Uh, John Taylor, a senior planner of the Greater Golden Horseshoe Greenbelt section in the Local Government and Planning Policy Division at the Ministry of Municipal Affairs, will speak in the second half of the presentation. And to begin, we'll have Allison Switzman, Senior Associate, Ontario Growth Secretariat, Ministry of Municipal Affairs. Thanks, Cindy. Good morning, everyone. So before starting the presentation uh, this morning, I just wanted to draw everyone's attention to the disclaimer on the first slide. It's important to note that the purpose of this presentation is to assist you in understanding the new policies However, it is not an exhaustive summary of all of the changes that have been made to the plans. So for those changes, we would encourage you to please refer to the plans for the exact policy wording. As mentioned, this, pres <coughs> this presentation will take approximately two hours, including one short break in between, and then it will be followed by questions and answers with the panel. You've just heard from Cindy about the process that the coordinated policy review has followed to date and the key outcomes of that review. As you're aware, the four plans were originally established at different times for different geographies and with different purposes. However, they all had complementary visions and were designed to work together. Many of the policy changes that have been made were to make the plans more consistent and integrated with one another and with the provincial policy statement to the extent possible. However, while many of the policies have changed, the structure of the plans and the primary means by which they are implemented have not changed. As you can see on the slide, the new plans include the Growth Plan 2017, which replaces the Growth Plan 2006 as amended, the Greenbelt Plan 2017, which, re which amends the Greenbelt Plan 2005 as amended. The Oak Ridges Moraine Conservation Plan 2017, which amends the Oak Ridges Moraine Conservation Plan 2001. And the Niagara Escarpment Plan 2017, which replaces the Niagara Escarpment Plan 1985 as amended. The Niagara Escarpment Plan took effect uh, just a couple weeks ago on June 1, 2017, and it is implemented primarily by the Niagara Escarpment Commission through a system of development control. 
The other three plans, the Growth Plan, the Greenbelt Plan, and the Oak Ridges Moraine Conservation Plan, are primarily implemented through planning matters under the Planning Act. All decisions are required to conform with plans that are in effect on the date of that decision. For this reason, it's important to note that the new plans will take effect on July 1, 2017. And until that time, decisions can continue to conform with the plans that were in place prior to the coordinated review. However, after that time, all decisions, whether by municipalities, the province, or the Ontario Municipal Board, are required to conform with the new plan. The only exceptions would be for matters that were historically exempted through either legislation or regulation. For the Greenbelt Plan and the Oak Ridges Moraine Conservation Plan, there have been no changes to the historic exemptions from the requirement to conform with those plans. So you should refer to the legislation and regulations for further details. For the growth plan, the minister is making some minor changes to the transition regulation to support the implementation of the new plan. The details of those changes that are, cu are currently posted on the environmental uh, registry and the regulatory registry until June 17th, and it is intended that the changes would take effect on the same date as the new plan, which is July 1st. In addition to the requirement for planning decisions to conform, the legislation providing for the Growth Plan, Greenbelt Plan, and Oak Ridges Moraine Plans require official plans to conform with the new plans within certain time frames. For the Greenbelt Plan and the Oak Ridges Moraine Plan, upper and single tier municipalities are required to bring their official plans into conformity at the time of their next scheduled official plan update under Section 26 of the Planning Act. Based on how the growth plan was implemented in the past and policy changes to streamline implementation, which I will speak to more throughout the presentation, it is anticipated that most upper and single tier municipalities will also undertake growth plan conformity work as part of their next scheduled official plan update. To accommodate variation in official plan review and update schedules, the minister is directing upper and single tier municipalities to bring their official plans into conformity with the growth plan within five years of the effective date, so by July 1, 2022. Further, lower tier official plans will be required to conform with the new growth plan within one year of the upper tier official plan uh, being in conformity. The slide also shows the timeframes for the province to issue supplementary direction. This includes mapping of an agricultural system for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, a natural heritage system for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, and a standard methodology for land needs assessment, all of which you'll hear more about throughout the presentation. It's important to note that as this supplementary direction is needed for implementation, it is intended that all three of these pieces will be issued by the end of this year. And to further support implementation, the province will also be preparing various guidance materials, which you will also hear more about throughout the presentation. So as you can see on the slide, the presentation is organized by six themes. For each theme, we will highlight the key technical changes to all four plans. The first two themes, managing growth and supporting complete communities, are primarily growth plan focused but the presentation will also highlight a few key changes to the Greenbelt plans as well. The third theme, infrastructure and climate change, covers all of the plans, but I would just note that for some of the detailed policy direction, the Greenbelt plans defer to the growth plan. For the next two themes, supporting agriculture and protecting natural heritage and water, these were core policy areas from the original Greenbelt plan. So in addition to explaining uh, the changes under those themes, John will also speak to how some of the policies have been incorporated into the growth plan going forward. Finally, the last theme will highlight some of the key elements of implementation, including performance measurement and monitoring. The growth plan and greenbelt plan were originally created over a decade ago to help manage growth in the fast-growing Greater Golden Horseshoe region. 
Changes have been made to all of the plans to better harmonize them, to streamline implementation, and to reinforce how they were intended to work together to manage growth. Both the Growth Plan and the Greenbelt Plan include new sections up front that clarify how they work together and with the other plans and the provincial policy statements. All plans acknowledge the history of growth and settlement in the region, including treaty rights and other Aboriginal rights. And the Growth Plan includes an updated and more explicit profile of the regional economy and growth management issues on the horizon. The original growth plan significantly changed how growth is managed through policy directions that limit development outside of settlement areas and prohibit the establishment of new settlement areas. It directed major growth to settlement areas with municipal water and wastewater servicing. And it provided more stringent criteria for settlement area boundary expansions, including the requirement to use the growth plan forecasts and targets. New policies build on that original policy direction and now more clearly distinguish between two types of settlement areas, those with delineated built-up areas and those that are undelineated. Built-up areas are defined by the built boundary that was issued by the minister in 2009 for the purposes of measuring the intensification target. And it delineated what was already built on the date that the growth plan first took effect in 2006. Some built-up areas remained undelineated because the settlement areas were below a certain size or servicing threshold and were not intended to accommodate a significant amount of growth. The growth plan now more explicitly directs that the vast majority of growth must go to settlement areas that have delineated built-up areas, and growth should be limited in settlement areas that are undelineated built-up areas. Settlement areas with delineated built-up areas are larger in size and better positioned to develop as complete communities. The growth plan is also more directive about limiting growth that's directed to settlement areas in the green belt, which you will hear more about later. And it also includes more detail about where growth should be focused within settlement areas, with an emphasis on directing growth to transit to support the plan's goals of transportation demand management and optimizing infrastructure. Integrated approach to planning. The new plan uh, includes a new policy that clarifies the expectation for an integrated approach to planning and managing growth. This includes direction for upper and single tier municipalities to identify a hierarchy of settlement areas or areas within settlement areas where growth will be accommodated. The objective is to improve the connection between the way that growth is allocated and the potential to achieve uh, complete communities. This integrated approach will be informed and driven by various master plans and technical analyses, which you will hear about throughout the presentation. And it will be implemented in upper and single tier official plans through the process of a municipal comprehensive review. A municipal comprehensive review has always been defined as the process by which municipalities comprehensively apply all of the policies in the growth plan. The requirements have been significantly enhanced in the new growth plan, which I will get into in more detail in the next slide. In the original growth plan, Settlement area boundary expansions and employment conversions could only be implemented through a municipal comprehensive review. In the first round of growth plan implementation, most municipalities conducted a municipal comprehensive review as part of their regular five-year official plan review and update. Key changes to the definition of municipal comprehensive review will further reinforce this practice. Those changes are that it can now only be undertaken by upper and single tier municipalities, and that it must be implemented through Section 26 of the Planning Act, which requires provincial approval. These changes are intended to help streamline the next round of implementation. In addition to settlement area boundary expansions and employment conversions, 
Many more growth plan policies are now explicitly tied to the process of municipal comprehensive review. Most policy links reinforce this more integrated approach to growth management. I would just note that the list on the slide is not exhaustive, but it outlines some of the key requirements that upper and single tier municipalities will undertake as part of a municipal comprehensive review. Most of these are covered throughout the presentation, but first I'd just like to highlight the policies that involve numerical increases, those being the forecasts and the targets. For these policies, the Municipal Comprehensive Review provides the trigger for significant changes to take effect, which is key to the policy-based approach to transition. While the Greenbelt plans do not use the term Municipal Comprehensive Review, the Greenbelt Plan and the Oak Ridges Moraine Plan now defer to a Municipal Comprehensive Review process under the Growth Plan for Settlement Area Boundary Expansions, which you will hear more about shortly. Also, as mentioned, the timeframes for municipal implementation will allow municipalities to coordinate their work to conform with the Greenbelt Plan and the Oak Ridges Moraine Plan with the process of a Municipal Comprehensive Review under the Growth Plan. Growth Plan implementation always required land needs assessment. But one of the key issues in the first round of implementation was variation in the methodologies that were used. And disputes, uh, disputes of this nature were the subject of many growth plan related uh, appeals to the Ontario Municipal Board. To help streamline the implementation of the new gro growth plan going forward, the province has committed to issuing a standard methodology for land needs assessment. The policies have been clarified to require that land needs must be assessed in accordance with this provincial methodology. And as mentioned earlier, the province will issue this methodology by the end of 2017. For fast growing municipalities, this methodology will be used to determine the size of future settlement area boundary expansions to accommodate growth to 2041. For slower growing municipalities in the outer ring, that may already have more than enough land designated to accommodate growth, the methodology is to be used as the basis for quantifying designated greenfield areas and any excess lands, which you'll hear more about shortly. Strategic growth areas. This is a newly defined term. However, it's important to note that it just replaces the original terms intensification areas and intensification corridors. It also expands this concept to include urban growth centers, which were a key focus in the original growth plan, and major transit station areas, which have more focus in the new growth plan. However, strategic growth areas can also include other areas that provide opportunities to accommodate significant growth, whether in delineated built-up areas or in designated greenfield areas. The original growth plan included some policy direction for intensification areas and corridors and for major transit station areas. There is enhanced policy direction in the new growth plan that, that prioritizes strategic growth areas as the focus for where growth will be allocated and land use planning will be integrated with infrastructure renewal. The new growth plan requires the delineation and establishment of dead density targets for all strategic growth areas in upper and single tier official plans. In two tier municipalities, the upper tier will then provide direction to the lower tier municipality to undertake the detailed planning. When undertaking this detailed planning for strategic growth areas that are located within the delineated built up area, the growth plan includes a new policy that permits municipalities to plan beyond the horizon of the plan provided that the strategic growth area is delineated and subject to a density target. That development would not exceed the existing or planned capacity of infrastructure or public service facilities. And that the type and scale of the built form would be contextually appropriate. So one of the key elements of the growth plan is its intensification and density targets. The original growth plan had three targets, the intensification target, 
a designated greenfield area density target, and density targets for urban growth centers. There have been no changes to the urban growth center policies in the new plan, and this includes the density targets. The key changes to the intensification target and designated greenfield area density target are numerical increases and changes to how they're measured, which I'll get into more detail on the next slides. But before getting into the details, I would just note uh, that I will, I will refer to different approaches to implementing the targets in the inner versus outer ring of the Greater Golden Horseshoe. So to be clear for those who may be unfamiliar, the inner ring are the municipalities that are inside and including the Greenbelt area, so Durham, Halton, Hamilton, Peel, Toronto, and York. And the outer ring refers to other municipalities that are generally outside of the Greenbelt area. In addition to these changes, the new growth plan introduces a fourth target, and that is density targets for certain major transit station areas. It is important to note that for all density targets, the growth plan now provides more explicit direction for how they are to be implemented in official plans, zoning, and other planning decisions. The intensification target continues to be measured in, as an annual rate of residential development occurring within areas that were already built when the growth plan first took effect in 2006. The original growth plan required 40% starting in 2015. This target has now been increased to 60%, but this will be phased in between now and 2031, with the potential for some municipalities to request an alternative intensification target. In addition to the numerical increase, the application of the target has now been scoped so that only development in delineated built-up areas counts towards the achievement of the intensification target. Going forward, de development in undelineated built-up areas, and as mentioned earlier, these are relatively small settlement areas with servicing limitations. Uh, development in these settlement areas would no longer be counted towards the annual achievement of the intensification target. In terms of the target increase, the policies provide that the current target that is in effect in the applicable official plan continues to apply until the upper or single tier municipality has completed its next municipal comprehensive review. So the original target would either be 40% or an alternative where it has been permitted. At the next municipal comprehensive review, an interim target of 50% will begin to apply annually until 2031. As part of the next Municipal Comprehensive Review, all upper and single tier municipalities can request an alternative to the interim target subject to certain conditions, which I will get into on the next slide. The new annual intensification target of 60% will take effect starting in 2031 going forward. As part of the next Municipal Comprehensive Review, Outer ring municipalities can request an alternative to this 60% target, but inner ring municipalities cannot. For all alternative targets, the policies require that they be reviewed at each municipal comprehensive review to determine whether they are still appropriate. A review would entail reassessment and re-request by the municipality and reapproval by the province. The original growth plan permitted outer ring municipalities to apply for an alternative intensification target, but did not include explicit criteria for doing so. Another key change in the new growth plan is that all requests for alternative targets require a resolution from Municipal Council. Council requests that is based on staff reports that are accessible to the public will make the process of establishing alternative targets more transparent. For the intensification target, a request for an alternative would have to demonstrate that the criteria shown on the slide there uh, would be met. I won't read the list, but the key criteria to highlight are that the alternative target must maintain or improve on the current intensification target, and that it must be ground truthed against the actual rate of intensification being achieved annually.
The original growth plan established a designated greenfield area density target of 50 residents and jobs per hectare measured across the entire designated greenfield area of an upper or single tier municipality. The designated greenfield area density target has now been increased to 80 residents and jobs per hectare. But this increase will also be phased in with the potential for some municipalities to plan to achieve alternative targets. The designated greenfield area density target is measured over the entire designated greenfield area, but allows certain net outs or exclusions from the calculation. The original growth plan limited the uses that could be netted out from the calculation of the designated greenfield area density target to certain natural heritage features where development was prohibited. The new growth plan has broadened the list of permitted net outs to bring more consistency to how the target is measured across municipalities. The new net outs are listed on the slide, uh, but the key ones to highlight are rights of way for certain types of linear infrastructure and employment areas. It is important to note that upper and sing single tier municipalities will be required to set separate density targets for employment areas to ensure that they continue to be used efficiently, which you will hear more about later. These new net outs will apply to the whole designated greenfield area, both existing and new, but they do not take effect until the next municipal comprehensive review. The reason for differentiating between existing and new designated greenfield areas is because the new density target of 80 residents and jobs per hectare does not apply to existing designated greenfield areas that were approved and in effect as of July 1, 2017. The current density target that is in effect in the applicable official plan applies until the next municipal comprehensive review. That would either be 50 residents and jobs per hectare or an alternative where it has been permitted. As I just mentioned, the new net outs will also not take effect until the next municipal comprehensive review. So this density continues to be measured based on the original net outs in the interim. Through the next municipal comprehensive review, inner ring municipalities will apply the new net outs across the entire designated greenfield area. They will take action to increase the density of the lands that are subject to the target. And after doing this, the plan density cannot be less than 60 residents and jobs per hectare unless an alternative is permitted. For outer ring municipalities, there is no differentiation between the target that applies to the existing or the new designated greenfield areas. Through the next municipal comprehensive review, outer ring municipalities will apply the new net outs across the entire designated greenfield area and apply the new target of 80 residents and jobs per hectare across the designated greenfield area, or they will request an alternative target. This different approach to phasing in the new target in the inner ring versus the outer ring recognizes the different planning realities in these different geographies and the need for greater flexibility over the long term in the outer ring. The original growth plan permitted outer ring municipalities without an urban growth center to apply for an alternative designated greenfield area density target, but did not include explicit criteria for doing so. As mentioned earlier, all requests for alternative targets must now be endorsed by municipal council and must demonstrate that certain criteria would be met. The slide shows the criteria that would apply to inner ring municipalities that are requesting an alternative to the target that applies to the existing designated greenfield areas, so the 60 target. I won't read the list, but the key criterion to highlight include uh, that the alternative target cannot be less than current plan densities, and that it must account for land built and detailed planning work that has been undertaken, both land use and infrastructure. These same criteria also apply to outer ring requests for an alternative to the target that applies to all designated greenfield areas, so the 80 target. 
For outer ring municipalities that had alternative targets from the first round of implementation, so less than 50, the key criteria are those that will maintain or improve on the current target and move towards more compact built form and complete communities. And as mentioned previously, all alternative targets will be reassessed and require reapproval at each successive municipal comprehensive review. The original growth plan provided policy direction for more transit supportive built form, and this has been significantly strengthened in the new growth plan. Schedule 5 of the growth plan now identifies priority transit corridors which are lined with committed provincial funding. And the policies require municipalities to identify those in their official plans. For major transit station areas on priority transit corridors or existing subway lines, municipalities are required to delineate the boundaries of those major transit station areas in a transit supportive manner. For these ma major transit station areas, the new growth plan establishes specific minimum density targets that are scaled to reflect the transit service type. So that is 200 residents and jobs per hectare for major transit station areas on subway lines, 160 residents and jobs per hectare for major transit station areas on light rail transit or bus rapid transit lines, and 150 residents and jobs per hectare for major transit station areas on the GO Transit Rail Network. These minimum targets are based on the Ministry of Transportation's transit supportive guidelines and are intended to support municipalities in planning for more transit supportive densities to optimize transit investments. Like the urban growth center density targets, these are gross targets, so they have no net outs. And this is also consistent with MTO's transit supportive guidelines. However, it is important to note that municipalities can request an alternative target for certain stations, which I will get into more detail shortly. For these major transit station areas, upper and single tier municipalities will have the responsibility of delineating uh, the major transit station area and establishing the target. But in two-tier municipalities, the detailed planning work would be undertaken by the lower-tier municipality. The major transit station areas are the area including and around existing or planned higher-order transit stations or stops within settlement areas. The definition of major transit station areas generally define the area by a 500 meter radius or a 10 minute walk. The policies require delineation in a transit supportive manner that maximizes the size of the area and the number of transit users within walking distance. Uh, Ministry of Transportation's transit supportive guidelines provide detailed technical guidance for delineation which, as mentioned, must be done by upper and single tier municipalities. Some major transit station areas may include features and or built form that would make it difficult to plan for these prescribed targets. However, the policies require a broad delineation that includes such lands and addresses this, this issue by allowing alternative targets under certain circumstances. For some major transit station areas on priority transit corridors or subway lines, upper and single tier municipalities can request an alternative target as part of a municipal comprehensive review if the target cannot be achieved because development is prohibited or severely restricted on a significant portion of the land, or if planning for the target would be premature given the potential for redevelopment of the existing built form by 2041. As with all other alternative targets, all requests must be endorsed by Municipal Council and must demonstrate that certain criteria would be met. I won't read the list of the criteria, but the key ones to highlight are that the target must increase the existing density of the major transit station area, and that it must not preclude planning for the minimum density targets in the growth plan in the future, 
as all alternative targets are reviewed at each successive municipal comprehensive review. In addition, where there are four or more major transit station areas within the same upper or single tier municipality on the same line, with one limited exception, the average of those targets must meet or exceed the target in the growth plan. This means that an alternative target on one major transit station area must be offset by establishing a higher target for another major transit station area on the same line. The settlement area boundary expansion policies have always been a key element of the growth plan, and as mentioned earlier, they can only be undertaken through the process of a municipal comprehensive re review. As mentioned, the Minister has committed to establish a standard methodology for land needs assessment, and the policies provide that settlement area boundary expansions can only be considered where need has been demonstrated based on that provincial methodology. Other key changes to the settlement area boundary expansion policies include land can now be designated to the horizon of the growth plan, which is currently 2041. So formerly the 20-year limit in the provincial policy statement applied. There are also more robust requirements for assessing the feasibility and determining the most appropriate location for a settlement area boundary expansion, which I'll get into more detail shortly. There are also new Greenbelt specific tests, as the Greenbelt and Oak Ridges Moraine plans now defer to these growth plan policies. Finally, there's also some new flexibility for outer ring municipalities with excess lands to potentially undertake a settlement area boundary expansion conditional on the rationalization of their oversupply, which I will speak to more later. The original growth plan required municipalities to assess the feasibility and appropriateness of potential settlement area boundary expansions. The criteria and process for doing so has been significantly enhanced in the new growth plan. The new criteria for determining the location and assessing feasibility include confirmation of the full life cycle financial viability of the infrastructure and public service facilities that would be needed to service the growth, the completion of water and wastewater master plans or equivalent, and a stormwater master plan or equivalent, which you will hear more about later. Demonstration through watershed planning or equivalent that the expansion would not negatively impact the water resource system or water quality or quantity. Where possible, avoidance of key hydrologic areas, the natural heritage system that will be mapped by the province, and prime agricultural areas which will also be mapped by the province as part of the agricultural system. Where the natural heritage system cannot be avoided, its ecological function, diversity, and connectivity must be maintained. It is important to note that this is a growth plan specific, as expansion into the Greenbelt Natural Heritage System continues to be prohibited. Where prime agricultural areas cannot be avoided, an agricultural impact assessment would determine the location with the lowest impact. Again, it's important to note that expansion into specialty crop areas continues to be prohibited across the board. Finally, settlement areas that are serviced by inland water sources require the completion of an environmental assessment to identify how the expanded servicing capacity would be addressed. The Oak Ridges Moraine Conservation Plan and the Greenbelt Plan were both developed prior to the growth plan and included their own policies and provisions for settlement area boundary expansions. As the growth plan introduced stringent tests, which have been enhanced in the new plan, the Oak Ridges Moraine and Greenbelt plans now defer to the, to the growth plan policies uh, and or the tests and process for settlement area boundary expansions. The growth, these growth plan policies incorporate the original policy direction from the Oak Ridges Moraine and Greenbelt plans. So for example, 
As mentioned, there continues to be no expansion into the Greenbelt Natural Heritage System and only settlement areas that are identified as a town or village in the Greenbelt Plan can potentially expand. The new policies also clarify what is meant by the original Greenbelt Plan requirement that any settlement area boundary expansions must be modest in size. These settlement area boundary expansions can be no larger than 5% of the current geographic size of the settlement area, up to a maximum of 10 hectares, whichever is lower. In addition, only half of that area may be used for residential development. The policies also require municipalities to demonstrate how the expansion would support complete communities and or the local agricultural system and that the proposed uses cannot be accommodated within the existing settlement area boundary. Through the initial implementation of the original Greenbelt Plan, one time minor rounding out of hamlet boundaries was permitted. Further changes to hamlet boundaries are now prohibited. Limited growth is permitted in hamlets only through infill and intensification and subject to the availability of appropriate water and sewage services. The definition of designated greenfield areas has been changed so that it only applies to lands that are needed to accommodate growth to the horizon of the growth plan. However, we know that some outer ring municipalities may have more land designated than what is needed to accommodate forecasted growth. This can be an implementation challenge when the designated lands are in the wrong place, such as places that have servicing constraints or other limitations. In such cases, a quantum of excess lands will be determined through the process of land needs assessment. So once a municipality determines the quantum of designated greenfield areas that are needed to accommodate growth to 2041, any additional lands within settlement areas that are designated for development would be considered excess. Upper and single tier municipalities will then determine which lands should be identified as excess based on their hierarchy of settlement areas. They would identify those lands in their official plan and they would prohibit development on them to the horizon of the growth plan, which is currently 2041. I would just note that any lands that are identified as excess through this process could potentially be revisited at a subsequent municipal comprehensive review to determine whether they may be needed to accommodate growth once the planning horizon is extended in the future. As mentioned, the growth plan now allows upper and single tier municipalities in the outer ring that have identified excess lands to propose a settlement area boundary expansion for certain settlement areas that have been identified as the focus for growth if all tests for settlement area boundary expansions are met, and if the overall quantum of lands that are designated for development would be reduced. So this would involve de-designation to remove development permissions and an inward adjustment of the settlement area boundary. Finally, municipalities are also encouraged to use existing tools under the Planning Act, such as deeming, to reduce the quantity of excess lands. The second theme for the presentation is supporting complete communities, which, is, which was one of the key trademarks of the original growth plan. Complete communities are places that offer and support opportunities for people of all ages and abilities to conveniently ac access most necessities for daily living, including an appropriate mix of jobs, local stores, and services, a full range of housing, and public service facilities, such as community hubs. Through the coordinated review, the concept of complete communities has now been integrated into the Greenbelt plans as well. As mentioned, the common theme of the policy changes is to direct the allocation of growth in a manner that supports the achievement of more complete communities.
Growth plan has been enhanced with more direction for how to plan for the achievement of complete communities. So for example, the policies promote more high quality, compact built form that includes open spaces that are safe and accessible and a more attractive and vibrant public realm. The policies also recognize urban agriculture and the importance of access to healthy and local food. And the policies support efforts to address climate change through the integration of green infrastructure and low impact development. There is also now explicit acknowledgement of the goal of social equity and improving overall quality of life, including health, for people of all ages, abilities, and incomes. The updated definition of complete communities clarifies that there is no prescribed scale. They can take different shapes and forms appropriate to their context. So for example, they can be settlement areas. They can also be mixed use neighborhoods or other areas within settlement areas. The new growth plan includes a specific subsection on housing. Whereas the original growth plan required municipalities to prepare a housing strategy, the new growth plan links this housing strategy to housing and homelessness plans that are required as part of the long-term affordable housing strategy. There is a new policy that clarifies that for any new designated greenfield areas added through a settlement area boundary expansion, the range and mix of housing options is to be determined based on this housing strategy. To support the achievement of more complete communities, there is also a new policy that clarifies that providing an appropriate range and mix of housing in the Greater Golden Horseshoe involves considering the existing housing stock and planning to diversify the overall supply of housing options as part of planning to accommodate the growth plan forecast and achieve its minimum targets. Another new policy provides additional clarity on the provincial policy statement requirement to maintain land with servicing capacity that is suitably zoned for at least a three-year supply of residential units. The growth plan has clarified that this requirement can be addressed exclusively through lands that are zoned for intensification or redevelopment. In addition, as part of the recently announced Fair Housing Plan, another new policy requires municipalities to consider the use of available tools to require that multi-unit development incorporate a mix of unit sizes. Together, these policies will support the achievement of complete communities by diversifying the housing options that are available throughout the region to accommodate a range of household sizes and incomes in convenient locations that provide access to transit and other amenities. All plans now contain new policies to support community hubs as a key component of complete communities. The Growth Plan and Greenbelt Plan support community hubs by encouraging the co-location of public service facilities and public services in community hubs and integrating them to promote cost effectiveness. The po new policies also encourage that priority be given to maintaining and adapting existing public service facilities and spaces as community hubs to meet the needs of the community and to optimize the long-term viability of public investments. The new policies also direct municipalities to collaborate and consult with service planning, funding, and delivery sectors to facilitate the coordination and planning of community hubs and public service facilities. There is also new growth plan specific direction that the preferred location for community hubs should be existing facilities that are easily accessible by active transportation and transit and are located in or near strategic growth areas. Growth Plan has always supported active transportation and promoted multimodal transportation systems that provide alternatives to the automobile. The policies for active transportation have been strengthened in the new Growth Plan in two important ways. First, the new plan has clarified that municipalities are required to plan for safe and continuous active transportation networks that connect to key destinations. 
and it has also introduced the concept of complete streets to ensure that the needs and safety of all users are considered during the refurbishment and design of streets. Note that the complete streets approach does not prescribe specific design criteria. Instead, it means that planning authorities must consider, as the default, how decisions must balance the needs and safety of all users. In addition to active transportation, Transit has also always been central to the growth plan as a preferred means of moving people. In addition to the new density targets, uh, which I mentioned earlier, the new policies also provide more direction for planning major transit station areas in a manner that improves the connectivity towards more transit supportive built form and design. Another new policy prioritizes transit corridors as the key focus for land use planning efforts. Uh, these encourage the use of tools that would accelerate transit supportive growth and development, such as alternative parking standards. The new growth plan also provides more direction for transit service integration across municipal boundaries and operators towards a more seamless regional transit network. Another new policy targets major trip generators such as existing office parks as a strategic focus for transportation demand management programs. As mentioned earlier, employment areas are now netted out from the measurement of the designated greenfield area density target. To ensure that planning for employment areas continues to make efficient use of land and infrastructure while providing flexibility for the changing nature of employment, Upper and single tier municipalities are now required to develop an employment strategy. This strategy will establish density targets for employment areas that will reflect the current and anticipated type and scale of employment that characterizes the employment areas in order to increase employment densities over time by identifying opportunities for intensification. These employment strategies are to be integrated with economic development strategies but the land use planning components would be implemented in upper single tier official plans through a municipal comprehensive review. Finally, I would just note that upper and single tier municipalities are now required to designate all employment areas in their official plans. The original growth plan provided policies to support the protection of employment areas. These new policies provide municipalities with an optional prime employment area tool. The so certain employment areas located close to major goods movement facilities and corridors with large lots are more suitable for land intensive and low employment density uses and should have a higher level of protection over the long term. If municipalities choose to identify certain employment areas as prime employment areas, they must be designated as such in upper or single tier official plans. And this designation must prohibit any office, retail, and service commercial uses that are not ancillary to the primary use. All employment areas continue to be protected for employment uses over the long term. So residential and non-employment uses are still not permitted. However, unlike prime employment areas, employment areas may permit a wider range of employment uses, such as major office, retail, and service commercial uses. As mentioned earlier, the conversion of lands within employment areas to non-employment uses can only occur through a municipal comprehensive review. The change in definition of municipal comprehensive review means that only upper or single tier municipalities may initiate an employment conversion, and that all conversions will now be subject to provincial approval. The original growth plan specified that major retail was a non-employment use for the purposes of this conversion policy. It is now prohibited in prime employment areas, but the plan recognizes that some employment areas may permit standalone retail. In instances where standalone retail is permitted in an employment area, the new growth plan requires the establishment of a size or scale threshold beyond which would be considered a conversion. 
The policies are also now more explicit that retail and office uses must be directed to locations that support active transportation and have existing or planned transit. And this would apply to any retail or office uses where they are permitted in employment areas. Another key clarification is that the redesignation of an employment area to a mixed-use designation, such as a regeneration area, would constitute a conversion and can only be done through a municipal comprehensive review. 